A warm welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani. This week, the 10-day protests in Nigeria came to an end with losses in property and human lives in its wake. It appears the president's speech on August 4th did nothing to quell resolve of the protesters who demanded an end to bad governance and an end to the cost of living crisis. At least 17 people were reportedly killed in Abuja, Niger, Borno, and in Jigawa State, with several more injured on the opening day of the protest. Meanwhile, the Nigerian Minister of State for Youth Development, Ayodili Olawandi, has called on youth to tap into the federal government's initiatives towards contributing to national development. His speech, made ahead of the International Youth Day, focused on the crave for young Nigerians migrating abroad, as well as the uncertainties trailing such adventure. The young people of this country are the formidable young people you can see in every part of the world. We are active. We have the can-do spirit. We are brilliant. We are focused. But are we channeling our energy on solving the solutions we should? That's a question. The Deputy Senate President, Senator Barao Jibrin, who was at the event, addressed youth restiveness and the protests against governance. He reiterated that Nigerians can make contributions to national development. The National Tenancy Assembly is committed to enhancing relevant laws that will make Nigeria conducive for youth, for our youth, and to remain, to remain here to contribute to national development. I assure you that both the legislature and the executive arm of government are working together to create opportunities for our team in use to redesign it of their potentials in life. The protests in Nigeria sort of mirrored the protests going on in Kenya. During the week, protesters hit the streets, this time calling for President William Ruto to step down. Police fired tear gas to disperse those in the capital, Nairobi. They demanded governance as a cabinet was sworn in. The demonstrations were a continuation of months-long tax protests that have since morphed into calls for President William Ruto to resign. Over in the UK, thousands of anti-racism protesters have been rallying towns and cities across the country following a week of violent disorder, including attacks on hotels, housing asylum seekers, and the looting of which was fueled by a false rumor that the Southport murder suspect was a Muslim asylum seeker. In the meantime, crowds lined the streets for the funeral of one of the girls the three of them who was killed in the attacks. Nine-year-old Alistair Silva Aguiar died from her injuries in hospital a day that the knife man attacked children attending the Taylor Swift dance class on July 29th. Six-year-old Bibi and seven-year-old Elsie Dot also died in the attack. Eight other girls and two adults were injured as well. In the wake of the riots, the Nigerian federal government warned citizens planning to travel to the UK to be wary of the violence occasioned by the killing of the three girls. The Minister of Foreign Affairs released a statement in Abuja on Monday, August 5, saying the violence had dangerous proportions as evidenced by reported attacks on law enforcement agents and damage to infrastructure. Citizens were warned to be extra vigilant and to avoid processions and protests and rallies and marches. They will avoid crowded areas and large gatherings, also to be self-aware at all times. And what's the basis for our conversation with former police and crime commissioner and former board member at the College of Policing in England, Festus Akim Busoye. He'll be joining us later on the program. But first, a quick check on other discussions in diplomatic circles. Russian authorities have begun evacuating residents from a second border region as Ukraine continues its surprise week-long offensive inside the country. So far, some 11,000 people in the Belgorod region have been moved, reportedly because of enemy action near the border. 
According to the Russian President Vladimir Putin, the Defense Ministry's main task is to push and to kick the enemy out of our territory. There has been a mass exodus in southern Gaza's main city as Israel announced a new military operation. The Israel Defense Forces reported having precise intelligence about renewed terror activities in the region after rockets were fired at Sufim. Residents in the Al Jala neighborhood scrambled to evacuate following warnings from the IDF. The UK High Commissioner to Nigeria, Dr. Richard Montgomery, has assured the large diaspora population in the UK of their safety and security amidst the ongoing protests in the country. During a visit to the chairman, Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, Mrs. Abike Dabiri Erewa, Dr. Montgomery said 12 towns in total were affected by the disorder. He, however, assures the Nigerian community in the UK that government is doing everything possible to restore calm and normalcy to the affected communities. The funeral for one of the girls killed in the Southport knife attacks held on Sunday. It helped douse tensions which were rife since the protests and the riots going on in the country after the attack on Southport. <laughs> During the most recent anti-immigration riots in the UK, the police had to deal with scores of demonstrators on the streets of Newcastle. I feel like my country's been overrun by foreigners, you know, and the communist, the, the government's communist, and um, there's, a, there's no vote and solution. Because every part is run by the Bolsheviks, set up by the uh, Bolsheviks. But I just feel like we have been forgotten about, we've been neglected by the Tories. That's why they got a pummel in the last general election. So people that actually didn't vote for Labour's policies, they voted because like, it was anti-Tory. That's the reason that they voted. So they didn't win on policy. They won because they just didn't vote the Tories anymore. And this is at the moment a broken Labour government and what they've been in charge for how long? Months? Two months? already in the country's in chaos. Protesters held signs and chanted slogans despite the strong police presence deployed to prevent the event from escalating. One counter-protester said people were taking part in the demonstration in support of the entire community. I've come to Newcastle today uh, partly to support family and friends um, but principally because I want to find the right way to stand up against some of the uh, racist violence that has been in England in this last week. One refugee decried the disadvantage of living in a hotel for two years. I don't like this living here really. I'm so tired. Me two years and five months living here. Living in a hotel, living in one bedroom. This me not working. Me not have money. Me not have anything. Me have my wife just living in Iran. This big problem for me. On Friday, hundreds of anti-racist protesters gathered to face off against a minuscule anti-immigration protest in front of a hotel accommodating asylum seekers in Crawley. You know, immigration isn't to blame for the state of this country. You know, we colonised and brutalised so many countries so they people have had to flee their countries and we're responsible for that so I think it's really important that we stand up and we stand with the community and say this isn't acceptable and you're not doing this in our name. Some, however, say attention should return to those affected by the stabbings in Southport. And all the news is all about the, the riots and what's going on, the far right. What about the little girls? What about the three beautiful girls who were killed for no reason? And we still don't have no answers.
Prime Minister Keir Starmer has denounced the so-called far-right thuggery and vowed that perpetrators of the racist riot would face the full force of the law. I utterly condemn the far-right thuggery we've seen this weekend. Be in no doubt those that have participated in this violence will face the full force of the law. The police will be making arrests, individuals will be held on remand, charges will follow, and convictions will follow. What's Palestine going to do with this? Yes! The police have confirmed that the 17-year-old suspect, who has not been named due to his age, was born in Cardiff to parents of Rwandan heritage, although there has been media criticism about a perceived lack of transparency. I want to bring in now former police and crime commissioner and former board member at College of Police in, in England, Mr. Festus Akimbosoye. He joins us from Westminster in the UK. Mr. Akimbosoye, thank you for joining us on the program today. Thank you. The issue of race is such a touchy subject anywhere in the world, but recent riots in England have shown that maybe people have not understood how dangerous it is to misunderstand it. Could you help probably explain this, you know, for our, to our viewers so that they have a, a better grasp of why this is such a touchy subject, especially in the UK? Well, um, first of all, I always start these kind of uh, interviews expressing my immense gratitude and appreciation to the uh, police officers here in England uh, who have been working tirelessly. Many of them have not had a day off. Many of them have had their annual leave cancelled because of the extraordinary demand on uh, police resources across England and Wales as well. So they are they they are heroes in many ways in this regard. But uh, you're right in identifying the fact that um, the issue of uh, race is part of the um, triggers in some cases of these uh, uh, riots, and it started off as protests, uh, and I think they've kind of revolved into riots uh, in England. But at the very core of it is a concern about uh, growing levels of immigration uh, into the UK uh, and the level of tensions this is creating in our communities. So th that is one of the key uh, drivers of this, um, of the ri riots and protests we've been seeing in England. Right, and, and the suspect, he's a minor, he's just 17 years old. Uh, police have only said that he's 17 years old. He was born to immigrant parents uh, from Rwanda. Uh, they are in Cardiff. But, of course, if he was born in the UK, it means that he is a UK citizen. So why is it difficult to recognize him as a citizen of the UK just because of where his parents are from? First of all, I, I would exercise, I would urge caution in um, drawing any uh, links between the riots, um, the protest, and this ongoing murder investigation. Uh, in my view, uh, the individuals who are out um, protesting uh, and those who are committing acts of criminality. Uh, would have gone out and do uh, and done this anyway. I, I think they just needed some kind of a trigger, whatever that could be. All right, um, but look, there's a, a ongoing uh, court case, uh, uh, an investigation, and of course, it would be wrong of me to to make any comments about that uh, in a public forum like this. But look, the reality of the matter is that we have always had an undercurrent of individuals in Britain who just have an issue with anyone from elsewhere, uh, apart from someone who looks um, white um, like them. Uh, and it's not even just about the color of their skin because there have been some who have attacked um, Eastern European migrants uh, over the last weeks as well. Uh, and it's quite traumatic, it's quite tragic to see uh, because I'm one of those guys, I came here when I was about 13 years old. I'm in my mid forties now and I, 
um, remember being chased by a far-right extremist group called the National Front in London um, many, many years ago when I was growing up there. And it kind of triggered some of those experiences, if I'm honest with you. Sadly, there are still elements of that. But what I will say to anyone who's listening to this is far from wanting to present Britain as the image of thuggery and uh, violence and xenophobia that some of us have seen over the last couple of weeks, in my opinion and in my experience, uh, Britain remains one of the most open um, and embracing um, countries in the Western world, in my opinion. And I've traveled across all of Europe. I've traveled to North America several times. And as a black man, if you ask me which of the European or American countries would I would like to be, would I like to live in? It would be Britain, without question. Well, the way you describe, you know, the riots, it just said it's a, it's a, you know, thuggery, you know, by these rioters, um, these anti -im anti immigration uh, protesters. That's also how the prime minister describes them, and he, he's promised that everyone who indulges in vandalism, anyone, anyone who indulges in in violence, will face the full wrath of the law. But is this a first time, you know, that such um, uh, 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 the the extent you know of uh, uh, these sort of riots have taken place in the UK because I, I oh, don't no. remember oh, in no. recent times you know that you know these issues have come to the fore and become such a a burning issue for for many in the UK. Look, I, I think the culture of people protesting right and voicing their anger even at the government of the day is enshrined in law. It's a democratic right that people have, and I would defend anybody's right, whether I agree with their reason or not, I will defend people's rights to protest uh, and to be angry even uh, if they want to. However, the moment that anger spills over into throwing um, firebombs at police vehicles, the moment that spills over into looting shops, the moment that spills over into attacking individuals um, for whatever reason, that becomes a criminal act. And the prime minister is right to have acted swiftly in um, you know, having the police to arrest these individuals, the Crown Prosecution Service um, swiftly uh, fast-tracking some of these individuals through the court system. And we're seeing um, some quite eye-watering sentences being given out within a week or two of some of these people uh, being arrested by the police. But this is not the first time we've seen this. In uh, a couple of years ago, we had the London riots, uh, which, uh, uh, which emanated out of the fatal shooting of uh, an individual in London by the police. And this sparked uh, riots, which then led to, riot, um, to looting uh, across the country as well. People were fast-tracked through the uh, criminal justice system uh, and they were being handed very, very heavy, severe sentences. My only concern about what is happening at the moment is that we do not want a situation where the state bears down so heavily on protests uh, and also on the judicial system as to be acting in tow to what the prime minister says. We have to respect the independence of the police from an operational point of view. We have to also allow the, the courts to meet our sentencing as they deem fit. I would feel very uncomfortable if the prime minister started to apply unnecessary pressure on the judicial system to apply severe pe uh, penalties just because we want to make a point. I think that would be a wrong step uh, to deal with this really serious issue. And I know the police must be exercising great restraint here um, with their yeah. own uh, reactions to what's going on. As a former police officer yourself and a former commissioner, how do you think that this, you know, how do you think they're managing their emotions as they have to face, you know, these riots? We've seen them even up until Saturday, um, those riots were still ongoing in the UK. It's tough. Policing in any walks of life in any part of the world is difficult. 
uh, in Nigeria. I'm very aware of the the protests, the end back governance protests, which in some cases have you know um, again morphed into riots and sheer acts of criminality. Uh, I, I know that in some areas it's even spilled into elements of xenophobia, where you have. I believe one guy is saying, you know, all Ebos must leave Lagos, which is just total nonsense and claptrap, if you if you ask me, really. Um, but policing this kind of public order incident is really difficult. I've been in one or two myself uh, as a volunteer police officer here, and it is tough. Uh, and what some of your um, viewers might not know as well is that in Britain, the police are unarmed as a matter of routine, even to have a taser. Uh, that is a highly regulated firearm that even your average police officer does not carry. So when you're facing a, 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 a baying mob that, is, that have got you know knives or other kind of uh, paraphernalia on them that they're throwing at you, you have to now wait for specialist uh, unit to deal with that. And you will not even still get firearms officers being called to this kind of roles. They will be uh, public order trained police officers who have their batons, they'll have the shields uh, to be able to protect themselves from um, uh, things being thrown at them. But you will not hear police officers in Britain um, come into a public order incident um, with firearms like we see in other parts of the country, unless there is any evidence of people carrying firearms that they can uh, use against them. But overall, it is a very difficult um, thing to do but I would say overall, the police officers in Britain, they have done a fantastic job in dealing with some of this uh, fuggery that we've seen on our streets. Uh, we'll close now with um, us referring back to the UK, um, the anti-immigration protests. So the UK has a race issue, they have a religious issue and an immigration issue. How do they navigate these so that they isolate these cases from a crime that has been committed in Southport? Again, I will um, not say the UK has a, a race issue or religion issue or, uh, or a, an immigration issue. Look, there's nothing wrong with um, uh, talking about immigration. You know, Nigeria has by far the highest uh, contributor to uh, immigration to the UK from Africa by a country mile. I think Nigerians uh, make are in the top five of top six of, of migrants to the UK. And many of these migrants, even though the vast majority of them are in uh, the healthcare sector, they are contributing to the economy. They are fantastic citizens. Uh, they have adopted uh, much of the culture of, of Britain. They love their fish and chips uh, that we have over here, as well as eating their jello fries and, you know, by Nobona, whatever it is as well. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But if um, there is a growing narrative in the community or in the country at a policy level that the immigration level is going out of control because the impact on public services and we need to have a better balance on who is coming in, what kind of skills they're bringing in, if uh, or not, this should be OK. I, I just don't buy into this narrative that it is racist to want to talk about, um, uh, about immigration. I think it is credible for people to have concerns about the migrant crossings. People were coming on the boats from um, France um, to claim an asylum for in whether rightly or wrongly. Uh, I think any government should um, have control of its borders and be able to determine who comes in, when and how many, and what to do if they have to be um, uh, deported out of the country. Uh, but overall, I'm not sure that I would say this level of criminality that we are seeing and the very xenophobic and racist narrative that we're seeing as well is uh, a representation of the generality of the population of Britain. That has not been my experience. And I think that's the experience of many, many other Nigerians, Africans, Black, African, Caribbean people in Britain as well. Thank you so much, former police uh and Crime Commissioner and former board member at the College of Police in England, Mr. Fessos Akimbasoye, for speaking with us on Diplomatic Channel. This is where we end Diplomatic Channel this week. If you missed any part of the episode, you can catch the rerun on the channel's TV page on YouTube. Just search for Diplomatic Channel. I'm Amarachi Ubani. I'll see you next time.